Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tracy Glenn and I'm one of the organizers of the Human Rights and Media Lecture Series uh, being brought to you by the Atlantic Human Rights Center, St. Thomas University's Department of Human Rights, St. Thomas University's Department of Journalism and Communications, the MB Media Co-op, and Raven, a Rural Action and Voices for the Environment. Um, so I want to begin by acknowledging that we, the, the organizers for today's lecture on the stolen territories of the Wolstoglawi, Passacotamakati, and the Mi'kmaq, uh, these lands are bound by the Peace and Friendship Treaties signed in the 1700s between the British Crown and the Indigenous peoples of the Wabanagi region. The Treaties of Peace and Friendship did not involve the Indigenous peoples of these lands surrendering any land. The treaties did establish terms of peaceful coexistence, recognizing Indigenous peoples of the region as sovereign peoples. If you live on these lands, you are a treaty people. The treaties are not the sole responsibility of the Indigenous people. They are our shared responsibility as Indigenous nations in our region go to court yet again to reaffirm their rights, including their rights to log, fish, earn a livelihood, we all have a collective duty to inform ourselves of the treaties and of the struggles as treaty people, which of course goes beyond uh, land acknowledgements. Uh, so this lecture series is part of the human rights and media class at St. Thomas University. Uh, so students in that class who are with us uh, today, uh, they, they wanted me to raise what I'm sure is on the minds of many of us gathered here this evening, uh, the anti-vax uh, convoy and blockade of downtown Ottawa last weekend by thousands opposed to pandemic restrictions. Uh, and what of course troubles most of us are the displays of, of racism, fascism, white supremacy and, and hate. Um, and Mi'kmaq lawyer and professor Pamela Palmeter, um, as she pointed out, uh, the problems with the racist double standard and how law enforcement agencies are treating this act of civil disobedience. Had Indigenous land defenders made the same kind of threats and disruptions, we know that the state response would have been very different. Um, so it is hoped that the series of talks on human rights in the media this winter will discuss such timely events in relation to the media. We will hear from scholars of the media and the law, media makers, journalists, lawyers, uh, grassroots activists on how our media landscape is changing. Um, and these speakers will tell us what they are doing to make our media landscape a more safe, just in, in equal space. Uh, so this series is made possible with a great team that I must thank, uh, Aditya Rao with the Emmy Media Co-op and the Atlantic Human Rights Center, uh, Shannon Brooke Murphy with the Atlantic Human Rights Center and the Department of Human Rights at St. Thomas University, Amanda DePaolo, the, the Chair of the Department of Human Rights at STU, Jamie Gillies, the Chair of the Department of Journalism and Communications at STU, Susan O'Donnell with Raven, Ashlyn, Ashlyn Albright and Jacqueline Cormay um, at uh, STU Communications. Um, so before turning it over to Adi Rao, who will introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to quickly announce the next speakers in our series. Uh, we have two speakers next week. Uh, on Tuesday, February 8th, Dr. Aaron Steuter, uh, who I think is with us tonight, um, Professor of Sociology at Mount Allison University, will be speaking about her uh, new book, uh, Won't Get Fooled Again, um, uh, a graphic guide to uh, fake news. Um, so two lucky participants will win a copy of her book, which uh, is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting read about, uh, about fake news. <laughs> um, so then on, on Thursday, February 10th, Aditya Rao, a human rights lawyer based in Fredericton, will be delivering the lecture, Hate and Human Rights in Canada, the debates being had over section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. Uh, so these talks, yeah, happen at 5.30 Atlantic time this time and here on Zoom, you can use the same Zoom link that you're using now. You can find out more about the series by visiting the MB Media Co-op website, mbmediacoop.org or our Facebook page, or by visiting St. Thomas University's events page at stu.ca. And all the talks will be made available uh, days after the talks uh, on the MB Media Co-op website. So if you wanted to, to watch them again or tell your friends about them um, at mbmediacoop.org. Uh, so now, Addy, I will turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Addy Rao. Uh, I uh, am also speaking to you from the stolen, uh, unceded, and unsurrendered uh, lands of uh, the Lostokwe, Mi'kmaq, and Peskotomokadi peoples uh, in what is now known as New Brunswick. And um, uh, it is it is a, a distinct honor and pleasure to, to be introducing uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Dubois, 
um, who, uh, whose work I have long admired and followed for quite a while. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Communication, uh, Communications and, uh, and, and is a member of the Center for Law, Technology, and Society at the University of Ottawa, which happens to also be my alma mater. Um, she uh, focuses on political uses of digital media, including media manipulation, citizen engagement, and artificial intelligence. Uh, her work is diverse and far-reaching. She has recently published a book that she edited. It's called Citizenship in a Connected Canada, which asks, I think, what is a very timely question. What does it mean to be a citizen in Canada in a digital context? Uh, she also leads the Polcom Tech Lab, which includes political scientists, computer scientists, and communication stu students, making it multidisciplinary um, and cutting edge. Uh, and in addition to all of this, uh, Elizabeth collaborates internationally with not-for-profits, with technology companies, with journalists and academics. Um, her public writing has appeared in Maclean's, The Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Policy Options, and several other publications. But what's also especially cool is that she is a podca podcast host. She hosts the Wonk and War Rooms podcast, uh, where political communication theory meets on-the-ground strategy. Uh, and uh, I was uh, fo uh, quite fortunate to be invited to be a guest on her podcast, um, where she gave me an exam at the end of the podcast to see how much I learned, uh, and I will not tell you how I did on it. So with that, uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Dubois, and I'm very excited to, to hear your presentation. Thanks so much. I, I'm so excited to be here chatting with you all today. Uh, you should definitely check out Eddie's episode. It was all about echo chambers and filter bubbles. Wherever you get your podcast, you can go find it. <laughs> um, all right. Today, I'm not talking about that, though. Today, I'm talking about political bots. So what I do as a political communication scholar is try and understand political uses of communication technologies. And right now, technologies that are particularly interesting to me are ones that are automated and kind of approaching this idea of artificial intelligence. So. Before I get into it, I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown on me. Uh, I run this lab, Polcom Tech Lab. The link to this spread uh, to my website is going to be active in the slides, and I will share my slides on Twitter. So if you have Twitter, you can go find them at Liz Dubois. Uh, and there's also a link there to that podcast. So when I'm talking about political uses of technology, this idea of political uses is an important first step. What I'm talking about here is when a variety of different kinds of political actors make use of different tools. So those political actors could be the ones that would immediately jump to mind, like a politician, a campaigner, a staff on a campaign or in a politician's office, political journalists, but it's also civil society members, advocacy folks, uh, lobbyists, uh, people like you and I who are just chatting about politics in our daily lives. And when we're talking about technology, that's a wide range of things, but for today, we're going to be talking about automation and AI, which basically means when you make a technology do a thing on your behalf without you actually having to like press the button every single time. So instead of pressing the button every time, you press the button one time and then you've taught the machine to keep pressing it on your behalf. So that's the real quick overview of what I do. Now let's dive in in a bit more detail. When we're talking about political uses of tools like automation and AI. We talk a lot about political bots, and that's going to be the main focus of my talk today. But I wanted to offer a little bit of wider context so that you know we're not just talking about the few kinds of bots that I'll go over. We're also talking about things like profiling and micro-targeting. So this is when a campaign or organization collects lots of digital data say you browse along Facebook, you leave all kinds of traces of who you are and what you care about and what you're passionate about and what you hate there, that kind of data can be used to then target ads towards you. And this kind of algorithmic advertising process is in this kind of lineup of things that we consider as automation and AI. Then we've got things like deep fakes, where you've probably seen videos of uh, a video that looks like it's, you know, President um, Bush is the is the classic example that gets shared a lot. 
Bush is talking and like he's saying things that absolutely he never ever said. And that's because AI can use facial recognition algorithms to recreate video as if it were real, but it isn't. So that's like Photoshopping videos. And then we've got this idea of computational propaganda where it's all the same principles of propaganda just done computationally and disseminated in new ways that are sometimes difficult to identify. So here you might think back to when we were worried about foreign actors in elections in Canada and the US uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and computational propaganda really became the term that folks in my area of study focused on. So these are just a few examples of ways that automation and AI are used in political settings. As I said, we're gonna dive into political bots in more detail. So when we talk about political bots, there's a bunch of different ways that they are defined. For me, I am focusing mostly on automated software programs that operate over digital media tools. In many cases, political bots get talked about as social media bots in particular, and we'll kind of pick apart that a little bit later in the talk. The idea about political bots is that they mimic real people and, and in doing so, they sometimes manipulate public opinion or they shift kind of the basic information and knowledge base in a way that changes other people's opinions or behaviors or beliefs. At least that's the theory behind them. So before we get into some particular examples, I wanna set the scene a little. Up to 15% of active Twitter accounts are social bots in some way. So this is not a rare circumstance. It is not odd that we would see accounts that are automated to some degree. And I would say it's not necessarily bad or problematic. A lot of the times when we talk about political bots, we focus on the real negatives, the risk of voter suppression, of disinformation, of interference in electoral systems, or in the development of political opinion and behavior uh, that is undue or unfair in some way. And certainly there are those kinds of risks. That's one of the reasons I like to talk about these things because the more aware we are of the risks, the better equipped we are at dealing with them. But there's also lots of really useful bots. There are lots of bots that help us just quickly get information out to different groups of people. Notably, 20 to 30% of tweets using election hashtags in the recent, the most recent Alberta and Ontario elections were identified as acting kind of like bots. So that's not the same as being a bot, but the fact that they act kind of like it does suggest to us that our media environment is already quite influenced by automation. And 80% of countries or nations which use cyber troops use bots. And so this comes from a study out of the Oxford Internet Institute and the Computational Propaganda Project, which looked at the use of automation in, seven, uh, in 70 different uh, national contexts. All right, so first off, what's that idea of bot-like behavior? Well, when we're thinking of bots, they could be those fully automated tools but sometimes we use the term bot interchangeably with spam, just content we don't like that kind of looks like it's a bot, even if it wasn't automated, it's just because it's the same message over and over again, it feels kind of body to us. And then there's trolls, the folks on Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and wherever else you are on the internet who are kind of in it for the lulls or they're in it just to spark some anger or some emotion. And honestly, it can be really difficult to differentiate between what's bot, what's spam, what's troll, what's just a person who kinda is a bit weird on the internet. You know, there's a wide variety out there. So some quick examples. Twitter taught Microsoft's AI chatbot to be a racist asshole in less than a day. This is an example from back in 2016 when one of the first kind of main examples of a social bot, so a Twitter account that was automated and it had been taught to interact with people that mentioned it. Folks on Twitter were like, hey, let's game this system. Let's see what we can do. And people on the internet can be horrible sometimes. And so they made it so that Taybot 
learned to speak as if Taybot were a Nazi. Extremely problematic. Microsoft took Taybot down within a matter of days because it was obviously really troubling. Then we've got this example here of people using the open forum for giving feedback to uh, US legislatures on how they felt about net neutrality. They created automatic mailing systems, which prompted people to go and actually physically type in or paste in bits of content. And so there, it's not clear that it's specifically a bot it's almost considered spammy from the perspective of the people doing the consultation, but it is definitely that sort of repetitive kind of content, same action over and over again, which is bot-like. And then we've got this account, account, Mike Allen, who no longer is on Twitter, but Mike Allen had all of the classic identifiers of being a bot. Mike Allen retweeted excessively, had thousands of likes and follows or following uh, and just thousands of tweets, right? Like way more than one normal human could possibly do or so a journalist thought. But a journalist actually went in, she worked at the Toronto Star at the time, she went in and figured out that Mike Allen was a real person. He was a troll who just liked to act like a bot. Right. And I say troll here, not necessarily in a pejorative way, not necessarily negatively, but in the sense of the idea of how this account, Mike Allen, went about using Twitter was to stir up emotional things, share a lot of content from a very particular political perspective. So we've got these different kinds of bot like behaviors. Some are true bots, some aren't actually bots, and disentangling can be really, really difficult. You could ask, why do we care about disentangling? That's a great question. From a policy perspective, uh, at the Twitter level, in terms of their terms of services, they don't want lots of automated accounts because that means that they don't actually get as much uh, ad dollars, right? Because automated accounts aren't going and clicking through ads making money. Uh, on the other hand, when we're thinking about how you might regulate something like hate speech and how you deal with hate speech, how do you deal with it when it is a specific person who is an individual who you can actually send law enforcement to their door versus a network of bots where you have no idea where they came from, who they created, who, who they were created by, or who actually would have the power to shut them down. So in my research, I've identified, along with Fenwick McKelvey, who's a professor at Concordia University, four key types of bots. And I'm going to run through these fairly quickly and then get into a few examples of kinds of bots we've seen recently in the Canadian context. So first off, we have amplifier bots. Named appropriately, the goal is to amplify messages. These are bots that have been created to fake support, create an appearance of consensus, target and exacerbate polarized views. Amplifier bots can be used for really great purposes like getting out the vote or really problematic purposes like trying to uh, exacerbate these polarized views and create a lack of so social cohesion and tension. When we think of amplifier bots and the way that they have worked within political media systems, these are the most noticeable ones because they are the ones where you see them actually posting a lot of content. This also means that they are the easiest ones for Twitter or other platforms to get rid of because they're identifiable. Then we have dampener bots and these shockingly are the opposite of the amplifiers. These dampener bots aim to confuse and obfuscate, to push away, to create chilling effects. Uh, they often make use of harassment and hate speech as part of their uh, strategy. So when people are creating these dampener bots, their goal is to make it more difficult for productive conversation to exist, to make it more difficult for people to express their views or their opinions. So an example here is there was a time when if you posted a tweet with the word feminist in it, an army of dampener bots 
would flood your feed and basically just send so much hate and harassment towards you that you took the post down, or maybe you left Twitter altogether. And that happened repeatedly until Twitter finally recognized this is what's happening, changed their bot detection algorithm and made it so that those kinds of bots that just based their responses on, oh, if this keyword shows up, we're going to send this hateful stuff. Twitter made it so you can't just automatically do that on the platform. And that helped solve that part of the problem. But that's a very simple kind of a bot. When we're thinking about automation as it's going to become more and more sophisticated as AI develops and gets used for political purposes, we absolutely should expect that these same basic ideas of amplifying and dampening are going to be parts of those strategies. Because all of it comes down to gaming the algorithm. Whatever platforms set out as their base rules, technically, in terms of what technically can happen, these folks who want to create bots want to advance their own political views, their own opinions, their own ideas, they're going to go to those margins of the algorithms and find ways to manipulate them. So this might look like getting a particular topic trending or trying to make sure a particular recommendation shows up when you search for something on Amazon or in YouTube. Uh, search results and news feeds are also algorithms that are pretty gameable. And so when we think about the use of political bots, we can think about it in terms of those like social conversations, those chats, but we can also think about it in terms of really getting at the algorithms that underlie our information systems and kind of just trying to mess with them, trying to make it do something different from what uh, they're initially intended to do. And some of you might say at this point, like, isn't that what search engine optimization is? And you would be right, that is that. But when it's weaponized for political purposes, that's when it becomes more of a problem, I would argue. So that's the first two kinds of bots. And I'm willing to bet that if you're here and interested in this, you probably would have already guessed that those two existed. Then we've got two others that I think are super important, but get way less playtime. The first is the servant bot. This is a bot that's created to do repetitive tasks. And honestly, they do it better than humans do it. So news outlets have automatically posting, uh, have the ability to automatically post on multiple channels, on Instagram, on Facebook, on their website, on Twitter, all at the same time, every time a new article gets added to their server. That's a really useful kind of automation. It's really, really helpful because when humans try and post on all of these different ones, it happens at slightly different times. People make typos. Uh, people forget a particular channel because they're in a rush. A bot's not gonna forget. A bot's not gonna make typos. You put it in right the first time, it's gonna go out consistently if you've programmed it properly. These kinds of servant bots, we also use them without knowing anytime we open Wikipedia, for example. Wikipedia is maintained through tons of bots that are busy flagging different kinds of common issues on different pages as people edit. And then human editors know to go in and do checks. And so these kinds of automated systems, which can be really simple kind of, if this happens, then fix it in this way, or then let this human know they need to go fix it. But they can also become more complex using things like machine learning algorithms to understand what humans are inputting and then have uh, more tailored and attuned reactions to it. So these largely helpful kinds of bots. Then we've got transparency bots. And these ones are really great at basically sifting through mountains of data because there's mountains of digital data out there. They're really great at sifting through these mountains of data and making it more accessible, available, organizing it better, shedding light on different things that are happening in a ways that would be either impossible or just really resource intensive for humans to do. So an example here are wiki edit spots, which are bots on Twitter that tweet every time an anonymous edit is made to a Wikipedia page within particular government IP addresses. And so this is a really easy way to 
quickly identify when anonymous edits to Wikipedia are being made via uh, government computers. And that can be really helpful for identifying when uh, government computers are being used to share really horrible things. For example, uh, there, the Syrian refugee page was vandalized at one point on Wikipedia by um, some uh, someone using an IP address. Uh, sorry, someone using an IP address from within uh, national defense in Canada. On the other hand, it can also flag really great useful edits where bureaucrats are making changes. Uh, to make sure that there is high quality information accessible and available. So these kinds of transparency bots can be really, really useful politically and are often seen as very good bots. But what I wanna do with the rest of my time today is actually try and tackle this idea of good versus bad bots. Because I think from the four types that I've just if that I've just shared, if I were to ask you, you know, which ones are good, which ones are bad, I suspect most of you would say, well, amplifiers and dampeners are probably bad and servants and transparency bots are probably good. And I think all of them can be both good and bad because at the end of the day, all of these uses of automation, all of these uses of AI, they are all tools that are being used by actors, actors who are making choices, actors who, are in a context making decisions about how these tools should be employed or not. All right, so let's take a couple of examples here. The first one I wanna talk about is SAMBOT. SAMBOT comes from the Samara Center for Democracy, which is a nonpartisan group. Samara paired with Areto Labs, which is a, again, nonpartisan, no political affiliation, they decided they were going to try and track toxicity in tweets that mentioned incumbent candidates during the 2021 election with a goal of better understanding the kind of online toxicity and hate and uh, harassment that candidates receive with hopes of shedding light on that kind of negativity in order to try and make it better, to try and prevent quite so much toxicity, to show who is having this extra level of work to have to deal with all of that. Now this, I think these motives seem like really good. We're happy with this kind of bot, right? The way that Sambot worked was it actually is not, you know, a tiny little robot with a cute name tag and like four little fingers on each hand and this little boop boop at the top, right? Like it's not actually a physical bot. What Sambot is, is a database of tweets that were being collected during the election and an algorithm that was designed using machine learning uh, technology to automatically review each of those tweets. And this machine learning technology, it learned how to say, this is a toxic tweet and this is a not toxic tweet. But the problem with Sambot, as adorable as it is, is Sambot's pretty much a black box. There's very little information available about how Sambot was deciding what was toxic and what wasn't. And there's very little information available about how the creators of Sambot were ensuring that Sambot was getting it right consistently. This becomes particularly troubling when we think about Sambot reporting, being reported on, uh, all of this information as an election is actually happening. Samara was releasing weekly reports, posting them on Twitter, newsletters, uh, getting a ton of media coverage, all about what was happening without any validation and reliability checks. And because Sam is a bot and we've personified Sam, it felt like there was some level of trust. We put AI in this black box and, and believe that it's this really sophisticated technology, so it's probably getting it right. And we see that more than 1.1 million tweets have been analyzed, so it must be right. I could never analyze 1.1 million tweets. And I'm not saying that I don't love the goals of Sambot. Sambot is doing really great work. And I actually do some similar work looking at political journalists and how tweets mentioning political journalists uh, are toxic or not toxic. 
So I think the ideas are really good. But what I'm highlighting here is something even where the creators have very, very good intentions can still be problematic in the way that it is understood in the wider media ecosystem, in the way that we treat it, and in the way that we question it and critique it. Imagine if this same kind of tool was being used by a partisan organization. And imagine they were claiming that uh, their candidates were receiving more hate than other candidates. And imagine they made a whole campaign around that and lot, gained all kinds of donations and support and people changed who they were gonna vote for because there's this swell of support. And then imagine well after the election, we find out that their black box, well, it wasn't working quite so well. And actually all of that information that led to shifts in public opinion and donating wasn't really founded. Next up, I've got the example of Polly. So Polly is a bot created by ASI, which is Advanced Symbolics Inc. They are an Ottawa-based market research company. They talk about how their Polly, who they personify as a woman, is able to understand people better than people understand themselves. And they talk about Polly as being able to get more out of what people post on social media than what they're actually even saying. The way Polly works is Polly also not an actual physical little bot, uh, not actually a person in any meaningful way beyond the language they use to describe Polly. Polly is a tool where a whole bunch of data from all kinds of social media are fed into this tool. And then Polly using machine learning is able to parse out patterns and identify patterns in behaviors over time. And then ASI claims that they can do something akin to polling to find out public opinion on different things. So in the last election, Advanced Symbolics was posting about how Polly sees the LPC edging up upwards and CBC dipping down today. And they were doing these daily updates and there's lots of graphs that are very convincing, but again, we've got that black box. And so here, Polly could be really great because it could mean that we don't need to rely as much on traditional opinion polling, which is resource intensive and not always that excellent at getting at what the, the public's opinion is, but it can also be really problematic because we don't know what data they're using, whether or not that data, um, you know, like your social media posts were actually meant to be used in this kind of way. So there's potentially a lack of consent, which could be troubling. And the thing that gets me most about using this kind of thing is it's this assumption that social media can somehow actually represent all Canadian voters, right? And so in this case, it's voters. In other cases, there's other ways to break up the population, right? But elections, you're trying to get Canadian voters. Just because I posted on Facebook doesn't mean that's who I want to vote for or how I'm feeling, right? And so that's a problem. But also, not everybody's on social media. Not everybody has access to the internet. In fact, large parts of the Canadian uh, population have very, very poor and very, very expensive internet access. And so when we're thinking about how these automated tools and how these progressions towards AI are relying on an understanding of who gets to count, that's also really scary, right? Like who are we deciding doesn't count in our political decision-making because we don't have good data about that. All right, and my last example here is wiki edit spots. So I already kind of mentioned them. This is the Canadian wiki edit spot, GCCA edits, says I am a bot, which is like the number one, are you a good bot or are you a bad bot? If you say I am a bot, you're already one step towards the good side. They also link here to the GitHub repository, which shows all of the code behind this bot. So if you are you know, a computer scientist, you wanna dig into it, you can understand exactly how this bot works. 
This is an example of a tweet that comes from GCC A edits. It says the name of the article that was edited. It says which government IP address, uh, department or agency edited, edited it, and it gives you the link to the specific edit. This is the example of the edit that was made. You can see here that the name of this particular city councilor was changed. It seems like a pretty useful edit. We like those kinds of edits. This is another kind of edit that was changed. Here, you'll see that uh, a former member of parliament, Rick Dykstra, was, uh, had an ethics complaint against him and somebody was trying to edit out the contents of that complaint on his Wikipedia article. That seems more problematic when it comes from a Government of Canada IP address, right? Like we don't really think the Government of Canada should be editing Wikipedia's knowledge of the ethics complaints against members of Parliament. I'll note here that it is actually possible that this edit came from somewhere on Parliament, so a political office where it would be less egregious to be making partisan choices like this, but still, you know, not ideal. And then we've got all of these examples of the news stories that swirled as this wiki edit spot was starting to surface the kinds of things. And none of the headlines were about, you know, city councilor updated, how great is it that our information is, is better now? even though the vast majority of edits made from government address, IP addresses, were actually those super useful ones. The only ones that made headlines were the really problematic or really frivolous kinds of edits, like Cadbury's caramel bars, not chocolate, says edit from defense. So this bot has this great, perfect, awesome goal of increased transparency. We think that's wonderful. What happens? government IP address editing goes down. Now that could be good. It could be like, look, we used a transparency bot to shine a light on problematic editing. The problematic editing stopped, that's why there's less. But the problem is we know that it's not just problematic editing that lessened, it was all editing. Despite the fact that the treasury board secretariat has explicitly said repeatedly that government employees can and should be updating things like Wikipedia and other resources that are very commonly used by folks in Canada to learn about their political system and their economic system and their culture and all of these other really crucial things. So this is just a quote from the Treasury Board Secretariat. Basically, they're saying, yeah, go for it. But then when you actually talk to managers within government, they say, yeah, well, even if TBS said you could, like, it might make a headline, so don't do it. And that's not great. You know, that bot was trying to prevent the kinds of problematic edits, but it doesn't, didn't really want to lead to a less open government, right? The creator of the bot who I interviewed actually is a big proponent of open government and wants more and truly believes in the power of tools like Wikipedia for information sharing. And so here we see an example of what we might have otherwise thought of as very clearly a good bot being potentially problematic in ways that are not, you know, Russian interference in an election or disinformation or voter suppression, which are all the big things we think about, I think, right now when we talk about uses of automation and AI in political contacts. So well, let's bring this back together. We've got these unintended consequences. And these are the things that I think we need to pay more attention to. We need to pay more attention to not just when automation and AI are being used by political actors, but how those uses are interacted with, how news media are reporting on them how citizens are engaging or not engaging with that content, how it changes whether or not somebody feels free and able to talk about feminism on Twitter, and those kinds of unintended consequences being a primary concern of ours when we're thinking about the role of AI and automation, that's going to lead us to better ways of understanding and addressing the use of those tools, because the use of those tools isn't going away. Now, as I mentioned, voter suppression is definitely a concern when we think about 
uh, particularly those dampener bots, but other kinds of automation uh, and AI use really are very clearly tied to voter suppression efforts in a variety of countries. And so that is a concern we need to think of moving forward. I think it's also really important for us to think not just in the context of political uses of AI, but in all uses of AI, the vast majority of the time, AI is replicating and amplifying existing biases within our society. AI is routinely sexist and racist and homophobic and discriminatory in the same ways that the system in which it was built is. And those issues are really hard to check for. The reason is we train AI tools using existing data sets, using existing information. And that existing information was created in our system, right? So I think regardless of whether it's political bots or not, we need to be thinking about this idea of trying to minimize the replication and amplification of bias in these systems. And then finally, I'll say, there is a massive, massive lack of transparency and accountability when it comes to the development and use of automation and AI. And we need to be setting new standards, demanding and, and requiring a level of transparency that frankly is gonna be bad for business. When we're thinking about those who might make money off of automation and AI, giving up the secret sauce, giving up the code behind their algorithm is not an attractive idea, uh, but we need to get into that black box and understand it so that we can critique it. So before I end, I will just give a little plug for that podcast that Eddie very kindly mentioned in his introductory remarks. Uh, I run this podcast, Wants in War Rooms, where political communication theory meets on the ground strategy, because I want to connect political communication theory with actual applied experiences of how politics and communications works. And so in each episode, I present a theory and then I chat with a staffer, a journalist, comms expert, lobbyist, activist, any number of different kinds of political actors. And we dig into whether or not that theory makes sense. Uh, and in Wonks and War Rooms, we've had some episodes on things like content moderation, on political bots, uh, and a number of other topics that are kind of linked to things I talked about today. So if you're curious for more, you can find Wonks and War Rooms wherever you get your podcasts or at uh, paulcomtech.ca. All right, I will end it there and we can go to questions. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> for that great talk. Uh, I'm just going to hit the stop recording button, button so that people feel free to, to ask questions.